Thursday at 11. Tonight on Nightline, critical care. Our cameras are inside one hospital to see just how fast the H1N1 swine flu can turn deadly as two healthy adults suddenly find themselves in the fight of their lives. The Twilight Zone, New Moon and its megastars, the vampire, see it. the heroine, I'm not scared of you. and the town that die-hard fans have transformed into an unlikely tourist mecca. Plus, put a ring on it, Beyonce says. But what about him? Why the man engagement ring is in and is tonight's sign of the times. From the global resources of ABC News with Terry Moran, Martin Bashir, and Cynthia McFadden in New York City. This is Nightline, November 11, 2009. Good evening. We begin tonight with the battle against swine flu and grim confirmation today from federal health officials that the actual number of H1N1 fatalities in the U.S. stands at 4,000. Now, that's more than three times the original estimate as fatalities linked to swine flu complications are now included in the count. And as Americans continue to wait for the vaccine, it's become painfully clear that this is a deadly virus that strikes at even the healthiest, as Chris Bury now reports. Here on one hospital floor in Cleveland, the H1N1 virus is showing just how random, powerful, and destructive it can be, even for healthy adults in the prime of their lives. You never want to see anybody like this, but whatever I got to do. <laughs> In room 13 of surgical intensive care at the University Hospital Case Medical Center, 44-year-old Walter Savitz depends on a machine for every breath. His wife, Margaret, constantly at his side. So now instead of, I think, five antibiotics, we have four. <laughs> Nearly three weeks ago, he came down with what seemed an ordinary case of the flu. The truck driver had been in excellent health until that Thursday morning. Just a fever, small cough, not a big... Thing. But during the next week, his condition deteriorated rapidly. By Saturday night, he couldn't breathe. He was having a really hard time. And by 2 a.m. Monday morning, he was in full respiratory failure. Next door in room 14, 34-year-old Robert Bradbury floats in and out of consciousness. It's really nice to see you again. Except for asthma that last flared up six years ago, he too had been healthy and strong. We're young people, young, healthy people, athletic, and, you know, he plays volleyball, you know, worked out, you know, we walk a lot, he's a non-smoker, you know, all the things that they tell you, you know, do. Just over three weeks ago, after a night of celebrating with his wife and colleagues, the Ohio restaurant manager fell asleep at work. I guess he laid down at work and never got up again. That Tuesday morning, co-workers took him to a local emergency room. They said that I should go, and, and they, they dragged me, and they picked me up, limped me in. Robert arrived so deathly ill, he was rushed to Case Medical Center for more advanced treatment. Both men were airlifted here from smaller hospitals. They arrived in critical condition, barely able to breathe. What is the single most striking thing about this illness? I think it's the rapidity with which patients get sick. Just how fast it happens. How fast it happens and how close they come to succumbing very quickly. Dr. Ari Blitz, a surgeon and medical professor, treated both Walter Savitz and Robert Bradbury. The night Robert arrived, his vital organs were failing. He developed something that I've never seen before in medicine. He developed four things at once. He had H1N1 flu. He developed a big pulmonary embolism, which was a clot that was sent off to the lung. He had a heart attack and he had a stroke. Was all he on the, the verge time. of dying? He was pretty much dead when he came in. I, I quoted his family that he had a 1% chance of living. 1%? 1%. One of the vascular surgeons came out and gave me his wedding ring, which was terrible, to say the least. Walter Savitz wasn't doing much better. His lungs were so badly damaged, the surgeon told us, it was as if they'd been torn to pieces. Both men were beyond the help of ventilators, so doctors performed emergency surgery. 
Generally what we do is I put this device in, through a big vein in the neck and it sits like this in the body. Uh, it basically goes across the right side of the heart and into one of the big veins draining the lower part of the body. And with this one catheter, we're able to take the blood out of the body, oxygenate it, remove the CO2, and return it. There are two chambers in here, out one and in the other. The procedure is called ECMO. That's short for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. In surgery, the device is hooked up to a machine that performs like a lung. It's become a vital tool in saving critically ill flu patients. Why did you start doing this with H1N1 patients? Because the patients that we uh, performed ECMO on, they were dying. They were all on death's doorstep, uh, would have not survived no matter what. These patients would not be around today without that technology. The technology is needed in about a third of the most serious H1N1 cases when ventilators are not enough. At first, the patients must be induced into a coma to let the body rest as the lungs recover. I gotta go in though. I think this is pressure is pretty low. I'm gonna change that dressing on his hand. It's cleaned up. The patients require round-the-clock nursing care. Pressure got low. He's on norepinephrine. In Walter's case, the nurse is an ex-marine, Madison Edge. Tomorrow, all the tubing needs to be changed. I've been doing this nine years, and I've never seen. Uh, an influx of patients like this year. The flu is straining the hospital staff. As many as 20% of the nurses here have been out sick. In October, the emergency room here, like many others, was flooded with infected children. Now the hospital is seeing an increase in adults. Most recover quickly. But in about 1%, doctors estimate, H1N1 attacks the lungs so viciously that vital organs are robbed of oxygen. Almost every patient that we've put on artificial support has not only had failed lungs, but failed livers, kidneys, uh, and even strokes and heart attacks. Walter Savitz is fortunate that only his lungs were damaged. But nine days after his surgery, he remains in a coma, unable to breathe on his own. It gets hard. Some days you just want to cry and cry, and, but I got to keep telling myself that he's doing well, and it could have turned out a lot worse, so. What's Walter's prognosis? I would say his prognosis is fairly good. Probably you've got a 75% chance of making it through, and I consider that good. You mean surviving? Yes. Uh, I think when he came in uh, without having ECMO, he would have died within 24 hours. Next door in room 14, Robert Bradbury emerged from a deep induced slumber. He looked at me and he made real eye contact. Two weeks after doctors told his wife that his chances were only one in 100. And he like slid over in the bed and put his head against my head. And then that was the day that I knew that he was going to be okay. Not entirely. Kidney failure has left her husband on dialysis, but he is grateful to be alive. You think they saved your life here? I know they saved my life. How do you know that? I guarantee they saved my life here. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here right now. That's for sure. To the Savitz family, in the room next door, his case is an inspiration. I had a pretty slim chance of survival there. Wasn't really supposed to make it. But, yes. Well, you ever believe in God now, you know? On Monday night, Robert, his wife and mother prepared for his move out of surgical intensive care to another ward in the hospital. Must be a great relief. Oh, it is. It is. A huge relief. That night in room 13, Walter Savitz suffered a setback. Attempts to wean him off mechanical breathing were faltering. In one room, a man fighting for his very survival. In the next, another one out the door on the way to recovery. Both struck down in their prime years by a fast and furious virus that works in ways so random no one fully understands. I'm Chris Bury for Nightline at Case Medical Center in Cleveland. And we extend our sympathy to these families, our thanks to Chris Bury. And when